if you've ever had an external server or just a system running somewhere else on your network, you probably used SSH at least a few times here and there. In my case, I use it every so often for managing my website and my web server. And I don't typically need to mess with that much on that server. Typically, it's just modifying a couple of files because maybe you need to update a link, maybe you need to add like a new page and things like that. And honestly, I don't know how I'm just discovering this, but SSHFS is such an incredible application. So right now, I'm not fully SSH'd into anything. I have access to all of my regular software. I can do all of the stuff that I would normally do on my system. But I have got access to a really cool folder. This folder right here, the data in this folder is not data on my local system. You might notice it's loading actually fairly slowly. This is data running on my web server. And I can do whatever I want to this data. I can add new data, I can delete stuff, I can modify it, all of that fun stuff. And this is running through SSH, through a system known as SFTP, the Secure File Transfer Protocol, which is supported by default on basically every SSH server that matters, and especially the ones on Linux. So let's see how to do this. What we need to do is run SSHFS, and then pass in some information. First thing is the username you want to log in as. In my case, I'm going to log in as the Brody user. And then at the server we want to connect to. If you have a domain name to connect to the server, you can use that. In my case, I typically just use the IP address. So in my case, that is 66.228.59.233. And obviously that would be different for whatever server you're trying to connect to. And then follow that with the colon symbol and then what you actually want to mount. So if you want to mount directly from the root, you could do that. In my case, I'm going to say var slash www because I know that's where all of my websites are stored. Then what you need to do is include a directory where you are going to mount it. I would recommend just making a blank directory that you only use for mounting things like this. In my case, I use a directory in my home directory, that being remote, and then from there, you can include whatever options you want. One option I would recommend including is the dash capital C option, because this is going to enable compression, which assuming your server isn't incredibly slow, is going to lead to some speedier access. You run the command, and then it will prompt you to use whatever means you would normally connect to that server with, whether that's a set of SSH keys, a password, or anything else like that. And once that is done, then you basically should be good. If we go down to that remote folder again, as we can see, the data is now here. Now, because this is using SSH in the background, it's obviously going to rely on your current SSH settings. So inside of your slash Etsy slash SSH slash SSHD underscore config, and also your dot SSH slash config. Now, typically SSH is going to default to port 22, but there are some situations where the server you're trying to connect to may be configured not to use that port. For example, you want to SSH into a non-rooted Android phone where 22 is just not accessible. So to change the port you want to use, all you do is pass in dash P and then enter the port number you want to use instead. While fully SSHing into a system obviously has its use cases, you can't do things like, you know, run commands through this method. This method also has plenty of benefits as well. Let's say you want to do things like modify one of the config files or modify some random file like your website, for example, but you want to do it through your local editor. Maybe that's even a GUI editor like VS Codium or Kate or something like that you can do it through this. Let's say you want to use some sort of non-standard tool to operate on the data. Let's say one of the LS replacements, for example, you can do it through this. And let's say before you actually copy a file from the server, you actually want to check its contents to make sure it's actually the correct file. Well, once again, this will let you do that. I didn't mention this before, but that is something you can do as well. So if we go into that folder, we actually can go and copy any of the data from the system. Let's say I want to go and copy, I don't know, this one right here. Let's go over to somewhere in my home directory, paste this here. It's going to take a little bit of time, obviously more time if it's a bigger file, but as we'll see down here, the file is copied just fine. I should also note that if all you want to do is copy some files, then doing so through something like 
SCP, for example, is probably going to be a better option. But if you want the flexibility of being able to actually view the file system and copy files, this is pretty much the easiest way to do so. So far, I've been demonstrating all of the data inside of LF, and there's a very good reason for that. When I am moving around my file system, LF doesn't actually CD into those locations. This is a really good thing because CDing is going to be slower than just basically listing out the data there. We can go and CD into these directories though. So if I want to CD into remote, you can already see it starting to slow down. And then let's say this directory here. I can do this and the command is running right now and eventually it is going to finish running, but I guess because of, yeah, there you go. I guess because of how far the server is away from me, it can be a little bit slow. Obviously, having the server be closer and having a faster server is going to alleviate that problem. Now, one important thing to note is everything on my system basically just works. So if I do something like, you know, copy this file here and then I go and paste it, it is going to have the correct permissions over on the server. It's going to say the correct user actually made it, and that's because the UID of my local user and the UID of the user on the server match. If they don't match, you're going to run into permission issues, especially when your local user doesn't seem like a user that should have access to those files. So what you need to do to fix that is you need to go and pass in a very simple option. That option is dash O, ID map equals user. And this is going to translate your local user's UID to the UID of the user you're connecting to on the server. Now, if you're connecting to a regular user account, like you just made a first account after the root user, generally those are going to have the UID of a thousand. If you have more than one user, that's where you'll generally start to see problems. Keep in mind that this doesn't affect the GIDs, your group IDs. Sometimes you need to be in a certain group to modify certain files, so those need to align as well. This can be addressed with another option. Dash O, UID file equals, and then the path to the file name, or if you need to modify the GIDs, it is going to be dash O, GID file, and then the path to the file. As for the file format, it's going to be the name of the user or the name of the group, so let's say the Brody user, and then colon the ID that it should have. So let's say a thousand or whatever you need it to be. And you can have as many of these entries as you want. It's just going to be one per line. So you can have another one that is say Jim, for example, and that is going to be on a thousand and one. Now, if you're using Simlinks, you might notice that files or directories are missing. And that's because by default, this won't follow Simlinks. I don't know why, I presume there's some technical reason for that being the case. But if you do want to follow Simlinks, what you need to do is include dash O and then follow underscore Simlinks. You probably get the idea by now. A lot of the options are under the dash O option. Really don't know why they have separate options, but it's the way it's designed. Another thing you may notice is if there's a lot of activity going on on the server, some of the data you see might be out of date. And if that does start to become a problem, let's say you're trying to modify files, you want to make sure you're actually modifying a version that actually does exist, what you need to do is disable caching. That is done by passing in dash O once again, dir, not die, dir underscore cache equals no. And that will disable all caching. This may lead to a performance reduction in some cases, but it is better to have data that is the data you expect. And once you are done with everything, you should probably go and unmount the directory. This is going to be done by using a fuse amount or f fuse amount, whatever you want to call it, dash u, and then passing in the mount point. In my case, that is going to be the remote directory. If we go and run that, if we then open up my remote directory that I still have on my local system, now there is nothing in here. Now, for what I've been doing with SSHFS, running it directly basically does everything that I need it to do. But if you happen to need a bit more of a, not powerful front end, a bit more of a better way to manage stuff, there are things like QSSHFS, SFTMAN, SSHMNT, and FMount.py. I haven't tested any of these myself. I can't say if they're any good, but they are listed on the ArchWiki as managers to help out with SSHFS.
But like in my case, if all you want to do is deal with one server, they're probably more hassle than they're worth. Now, for anyone in the know, you probably know that SSHFS has been through a couple of different maintainers. And as of 12 days ago, the latest maintainer decided that he didn't want to continue the project anymore. And the project is now archived. This is not the first time this has happened. And considering how popular this project is, I do hope that someone who has the knowledge to manage it does come along and take it over. Because I really like this and I don't want to see it stop working. But the best that I can do is promote the application, hopefully someone sees this that has SSH knowledge, and decides to actually take it over. I would hate to see a project that's this useful just fall to the wayside and be forgotten to time. And I wish I knew about this earlier. There are so many times where I could have used this instead of fully SSHing into a server, and it would have saved me so much time, and I would have been able to use my local applications. So let me know down below, did you know about SSHFS? And if you didn't know about it, let me know what you think about it, and is this something you would go and use, especially if a new maintainer actually comes around and takes over the project? I would love to know. So if you like this video, I'm going to go and like the video. If you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe, subscribe, barrel pay linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over T. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Optum Plays. That's going to be it for me and I'm out.